Good evening, friends. It's lovely to see you again. We are busy with Revelation of Hope. And tonight's topic, Revelation predicts the United States in prophecy. This is so amazing that the USA appears in the book of Revelation. Now, not all countries are spoken about in the Bible. Only those ones that relate directly to God's people and those that have key roles that they play in last day events. When a nation or ancient kingdom plays a significant part in the fulfillment of God's purposes, that empire is described by the Bible prophets. To fully understand what really happened, how America appears in Bible prophecy, we need to go back a little bit. We need to go back to the year 1776. The Continental Congress is having a debate in Philadelphia. It's a very intense discussion. They have to decide, is America going to declare independence from England? July 2, 1776. This debate went on virtually the whole night. And then they came to the vote. After they voted, they counted. The vote for independence was deadlocked. It was a tie. Delaware, which is one of the states in the east, had three representatives that could vote. The one voted for independence. The one voted against independence. And the third one was on his farm. But it was raining and pouring and the roads were full of mud. And he decided that he couldn't go up for this congress. But the news about the deadlock vote went out like wildfire there in the east coast. This is the side of the Atlantic Ocean. And this man then decided, I have to go. He got on his horse and he rode the whole night. Got there the next morning to cast the deciding vote with regard to the future of America. There was a grandfather who said to his grandson, you must look through the keyhole to see if they're going to vote and if they're going to sign that paper. You must have a look. And this, as the story goes, the grandfather was a bell ringer and he would ring the bell if there was liberty. This little boy was peeping and he saw this man making his vote. And he, the grandfather said, they're not going to sign, they're not going to sign. And the little boy says, he's just voted. And they're signing. Ring, grandpa, ring for liberty. And grandpa rang the bell. And this sound went forth. America was a land of liberty. The United States Constitution guarantees both civil and religious freedom to all its citizens. This is in the First Amendment that you cannot control people's conscience with regard to civil and religious rights. A new nation was born. This is the first time that this ever happened in history that a land of liberty was born. 
Will these historic freedoms ever be challenged? This is a big question that we need to ask. Will those laws ever be changed? Does the Bible mention the United States in prophecy? Tonight we're going to have a look at a very interesting portion of Scripture. Wouldn't it be strange for God to raise up a nation committed to the ideal of democracy and not mention that at all in Bible prophecy? We must remember that God is for freedom. God is for freedom of conscience, freedom of choice. So to me it only makes sense that a nation that stands for freedom will be mentioned in the Word of God. The book of Revelation outlines the final events of Bible prophecy. And the USA is part of the final events. You'll remember that as we went through our lectures, we saw that there were a number of nations that played a vital part in the history of God's people. Remember Babylon took the children of Israel captive and they destroyed Jerusalem. Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon. That's the bear. The chest of silver. And let God's people go. Then we have Greece, the leopard, and the thighs of bronze. Greece gave an international language to the world. Did you know that the whole New Testament was written in Greek? Here was a language that could get God's word out to everyone. And Rome, we will remember, is the legs of iron and this dragon-like beast. This is the power that attempted to kill Jesus when he was a baby. The power that tried him and ultimately where he was crucified. It was Roman soldiers who did the dirty work. And then we have the church state union. We see how God's people were persecuted for their faith by this union of church and state in the dark ages especially. And then we go to Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Daniel 7, 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So what is a beast in Bible prophecy? It's a kingdom. Here we have the beast. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Beasts represent nations. Revelation 17 verse 15. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Friends, what does water represent? In prophecy, people, a populated area. So we need to ask a few questions about the beast. Where does this power arise? This is the beast in the latter part of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 verse 1 to 10 talks about the papacy. We've done this in a previous lecture. The beast that comes out of the sea. Now we must ask this beast, the lamb-like beast, where does it arise? The Word of God says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. This new beast comes up out of the earth or a sparsely populated area. Does that make sense? If the sea is a 
a populated area congested with people. The opposite of the sea is the earth, and that must then be a sparsely populated area. It talks about a new nation arising, not where another nation had stood before. The Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. They increased the empire. The Greeks took over Medo-Persia. They increased the empire. Rome took over from Greece, increased the empire. But here we have a nation arising where there is no other nation that has ruled like those ones, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. When does this power arise? He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. This is the last verse talking about the papacy. The Bible says that the papacy would get its power from the dragon, pagan Rome, and it did. The Bible says that the papacy would be a worldwide power, religious power, and it is. The Bible says that the papacy's priests would forgive sins, and they do. And it says that the papacy would reign from 538 to 1798, 1260 years. And it did. You must remember that in 538, that was when Emperor Justinian gave civil and religious power to the Pope. And that's when the papacy stood up as a mighty force, a, a union of church and state. It became a persecuting power. But in 1798, that power was broken when Napoleon's general Berthier took the Pope captive. How does this power arise? Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Two horns like a lamb. Now you must remember, the lion is a mature, fully grown animal. The bear, mature, fully grown. The leopard, mature, fully grown. And this dragon-like beast, mature, fully grown. They are old nations but what about this one a lamb is a young animal it's a new nation a young nation and what's interesting it has two horns like a lamb but what is absent on those horns there are no crowns on the horns of the second beast do you notice that the first beast has crowns then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. Crowns indicate kingly authority. The absence of crowns indicates freedom from kingly authority. Authority. It indicates a new type of government. A republican type of government. A democratic type of government. It's a new system. Horns are a symbol of power. They indicate that this beast derives its power from political and religious what? Freedom. So the one horn is religious freedom and the other horn is political freedom 
a lamb-like beast arising around 1798. You must remember that the one goes into captivity when? 1798. And the one arises. It's around that time when this beast arises. Arising in a relatively unpopulated area. A new world. No crowns on its horns. No kingly authority. We read the new world compared to the old. G.A. Townsend, page 635. The mystery of her coming forth from vacancy, like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. This is talking about America. Coming forth from vacancy. This interesting statement is written by Uriah Smith in the book Daniel and the Revelation, page 578. Emerging amid the silence of the earth, adding daily to its power and strength. This nation arose sort of out of nowhere. It's incredible. So this lamb-like beast arises around 1798. Arises in a relatively unpopulated area and it has no crowns on its horns. It would be a young nation like a lamb. And something that I might add, in the book of Revelation, a lamb symbolizes Christ. So this would be a Christian nation, different from the other pagan ones. It would rise to a position of worldwide power and influence. Isn't that incredible? There was no nation there. It would rise to have worldwide power and influence. What is the only nation that fits this description, would you say? The United States of America. And I'm thankful that this nation came into existence. A nation where people could be free to exercise their faith according to their heart's conviction. In fact, their drive for religious freedom has spread around the world and many nations have been re relieved and released from oppression with regard to religious freedom. He has the Statue of Liberty. And at the bottom, on a plaque, the end of this poem, it says, Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. A country that is welcoming people to come and say, come and be free. Come and worship God according to your conscience. Yes, friends, a nation of liberty, a nation of religious freedom, the United States of America. Revelation 13, verse 11 to 14. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but now something happens, and spoke like a, like a dragon. So something is going to change in this nation of freedom, this nation of religious and civil liberty. And how does any nation speak? It speaks through its laws, doesn't it? That's how they speak. Does the book of Revelation describe the events that will lead up to this erosion of religious liberty, this union of church and state? 
and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship who? The first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Can you remember what year the healing took place? 1929. Remember, 1929 when Mussolini gave the papacy civil rights. There's going to be a church and state union again. This is incredible to think of. That this nation that left the shores of Europe to have freedom from the church and state union are going to enforce it again according to Bible prophecy. And how does he do this? He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Fire in the Old Testament was a symbol of God's presence. Remember the fiery pillar at night above the Israelite camp. Remember the Shekinah glory, this fire that was above the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim, a symbol of God's divine presence. You remember fire coming down from heaven in the time of Elijah, where God showed that He was the true God. Even in the New Testament, you've got fire coming down, a symbol of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Remember, so here we have false fire that comes down. A false Holy Spirit. A false revival. And it's done with signs, wonders, and false miracles. And what is the result of this? He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. This is talking about the first beast. If you look at America today, there's social problems, drugs, sexual immorality, economic uncertainty, rising crime, natural disasters it looks like this wonderful country is busy going down the drain revelation 13 11 14 11 to 14 telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived so in a time where the country is going down, you have this false religious awakening, a false outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that brings religious leaders together. And they put force on the legislators to make laws that will once again govern conscience govern freedom of religion in fact it will be taken away now it says it made an image to the beast so what is the image to the beast if you say to someone your child is a splitting image of you what does it mean child looks like you isn't it so here is something that looks like the beast, the one that comes out of the sea. An image is a likeness of. Church and state will unite to enforce religious practices. Remember, the first beast was a union of 
church and state. So the image of the beast will be a union of church and state. Does the Bible give any indication of end time events in light of this union? We need to go to Revelation chapter 18. The events surrounding this union. Her sins have reached to heaven. This is a time where morality is going down at a rapid pace. If you think of abortion, homosexual marriages, crime and violence is rife. Young people have no respect for the elderly. Things are just going out of hand. The things that are portrayed on television, on the internet, it's scary. The sins have reached to heaven like the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. A time of great wickedness. And at this time, there's a revival. It comes from churches that are not fully committed to God's truth. And the emphasis is not on the word of God. It is on signs, miracles, wonders. That's the emphasis. She has lived luxuriously. So there is an e economic boom. Things are going very well. But then suddenly things change. It's at this time where there is e an economic high. You've got the spirituality going down. Morals are going down. There is disasters. There is earthquakes. There is fires. There's tornadoes, there's hurricanes, and at this time, the economic bottom falls out. She experiences natural disasters. If you think of things that have happened recently, just in the last few weeks, remember Hurricane Sandy? Happened just the other day. Another big one, Hurricane Katrina, remember? And we wonder how many more are going to come. Earthquakes. Things are going out of hand. God's judgments begin to fall in the land. Now you can imagine. The religious leaders are looking around and seeing that things are going wrong. Things are going out of hand. The political leaders see that we've got big trouble. And that's when they come together and say, let's turn back to God. Which is a good thing. But don't take away people's freedom of conscience. Don't make laws that force them to do certain things against their will. Her riches come to nothing. So it's at this time where we have all these things coming together, that there's a huge economic collapse. And that's when people start panicking, isn't it? That's when people start grabbing at anything to save them. A spiritual decline, natural disasters, social chaos, and economic difficulties lead up to this church and state union. It's a master plan that Satan has worked out. It's a master plan. Because it's actually many, many innocent people that think, well, this is the only way. We must force America to come back to God. And in that way, church and state merge. Satan takes advantage of this situation by introducing a what? A false spiritual revival. 
He performs great signs. Now this is talking about Satan. So that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Yes, friends, there is a hype, a spiritual hype where people are swept by this tide of emotionalism, this tide of the so-called workings of the Holy Spirit. People are not thinking rationally. They're not basing their beliefs on the Word of God, but they are following their emotions. And we must be careful that we don't get swept away when we see these things. Because it's going to be so real. Your senses will be telling you that this is it. This is the real. This is the true. But what does the Bible say about these miracles? Revelation 16 verse 14. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So can you see what's happening? You have everything going down. There's this huge revival and that forces the kings, the legislators to make laws. Don't misunderstand me. In the last days, there is also a true revival. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on God's people. God will do great things. The sick will be healed. The gospel is going to go forth with great power. But if we study the pattern of Satan, for every genuine there is a, a counterfeit. There's a false one. So he will make sure that he will start his false religious revival. The false outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So that there will be confusion even amongst the faithful followers of God. And this false revival drives legislators to issue laws on morality. It's a master plan of the evil one. How can you tell the difference between the true and false revival? We need to go to Matthew 7 and we read verse 21 to 23. These verses are difficult verses in the Bible. But I'm so glad that they are there. They are there to warn us. Jesus is speaking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you must remember, if you love Jesus, which I believe all of us do, love always leads to what? Obedience. Love leads to obedience. Jesus says in John 14 verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Which commandments? The Ten Commandments. God's law of love. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that's going to go in. But who's going to go in? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many. That's a sad word, isn't it? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These all sound like good things, don't they? They sound like wonderful things, but not at the expense of truth. 
not at the expense of obedience to the law of God. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. They are not keeping God's law. And you can't just keep the commandments that suit you. You can't say, well, I will keep nine of them and uh, the one about adultery, you know, <coughs> my neighbor's got a nice looking wife. So that one I'm going to, you know, conveniently ignore. We can't do that, can we? It's all or nothing. And what's so amazing is that the majority of the Christian world agree on nine of the commandments. But the one about relationship, the one who identifies God as our creator, our maker, the one that says what his dominion is, heaven and earth, the one that is the sign between him and his people is put away. I heard this illustration once. The Christian world says that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, were nailed to the cross. Who of you has heard that before? I think many of us have heard that. The law has been nailed to the cross. But then if you say to that person, can I take your wife? No. Can someone steal your car? No. Can your children speak disrespectfully to you? No. Can we bow down to images? No. Etc., etc., etc. So what they've done is they take the Ten Commandments, picture them as the Ten Fingers, and they cut them off. They say, no, these have been nailed to the cross. Think of a big shears, cutting them off. And they throw them there in the dustbin. Got rid of the Ten Commandments. But then they go back, take out one finger after the next, and they have them sewn on again. But they leave the fourth one in the bin. They don't want that one. Satan knows that that commandment is the one that is the heart. It's the seal. It's the sign. It's the relationship commandment. The one that empowers you to keep all the others. Because if you spend one day in seven with Jesus, it strengthens you as one of his followers, doesn't it? Especially the day that he has blessed and sanctified, made holy. Yes, friends, it doesn't matter if people are saying that they've cast out demons, done mighty miracles, prophesied in the name of Christ. The litmus test is, are they obedient to His law? That's how we will see which is a false and which is a genuine revival. The evidence is not what they claim to do in His name. The evidence is an obedient life. Isaiah 8 verse 20. This is the test to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is an important verse to remember. The Bible says to the law, the Ten Commandments, the testimony of Scripture, if they are not teaching in harmony with God's law, it is because there is how much light? No light. Not 50% or 99%. If they are not teaching according to the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. That's how you differentiate between the true revival and the counterfeit 
revival. If the devil wanted to unite people religiously, what vehicle might he use? What do you think? There's something that most Christians agree upon. There's something. What vehicle did he use in the early Christian church? Remember, we had the pagans on the one side and the Christians on the other side. And what vehicle was used to bring them together? It was the worship on the day of the sun. Yes, Sunday worship united the ancient world in the early centuries. Do you think Satan could possibly employ that vehicle again? Many people will say it's impossible. It's not possible that he could force something like that, especially in a country where there's freedom of religion. We are going to have a look at some recent happenings. And this is going to give us some clues about what is going to happen at the end of time. We read from the Two Babylons, page 105, Alexander Hislop. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated and to get paganism and Christianity. Now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, to shake hands. Is it possible that the wall separating church and state could start crumbling? This is Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Speaking from America, the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. So he says that that wall is not a good thing. Chief Justice. The St. Louis Dispatch, October 29, 1991. As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close. I remember they, they became a nation in the late 1700s. So one century later was the late 1800s. And now the second century later is the late 1900s. So what does he say? As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close... The Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. This is now in from 2000 approximately and onwards. Redefining what religious liberty will mean. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. So this means that these laws will be to the benefit of the mainstream religions, but those that are not with the mainstream ones, this is not going to benefit them. In fact, it will hurt them. Yes, friends, the legal system, the justices, the judges, those that ultimate, ultimately decide people's fate are speaking. They're saying that things are changing in America. Now what's very interesting, Justice William O. Douglas 
he did not want to cast the vote. He didn't want to go with the majority. And this is what he said about this one thing. It seems to be plain that by these laws, the states compel one under the sanction of law to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's views on that day. The state law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. Now this is talking about laws that are on the books of America. And he says that these laws will actually affect conscience. So he voted again. He actually refrained from voting. So we can see, friends, that there are movements happening in this land of liberty. We can see that there's something going in the direction, something that has happened before that resulted in great persecution, something that I believe is going to happen very soon. The union of church and state. In 1976, the month of May, there was a huge crisis. There was a fuel crisis in America. I don't know if any of you can remember that. I know in South Africa we've also had sometimes a fuel crisis where the people line up queues and queues to get fuel. Now, let's see what happened in 1976 in America. Harold Linzel the editor of Christianity Today, May 7, 1976, said, All businesses, this is a proposal he made, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday. By force of legislative fight through the duly elected officials of the people. So what he was saying is, to save this situation, let's close the shops, the gas stations on Sunday. We are saving fuel and we're getting the people back to God. It sounds good, doesn't it? But it's legislative. What's going to happen if there's a huge crisis? Can you imagine? A huge crisis. Yes, friends, the nation of freedom, the nation of liberty, the beast that came out of the earth, the lamb-like beast with the two horns, starts to speak like a dragon. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Death decree if you don't go with the laws. I had a very interesting experience. In 2008, we were visiting Italy. We went to Rome. We went to go and look at the Vatican. And that very day, while we were in the Vatican, there was a police command given that we must evacuate the Vatican. Now there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the Vatican. It's a huge place. I mean, it's a country, if you know what I mean. It's, it's a state. Now, the reason for this was George Bush came for his last visit to the Pope. Who? The President of the United States came to visit the Pope. And for two hours, 
the Vatican was cordoned off. And they had their meeting. So this is the president of the Protestant nation, America, coming to have a secret interview with the Pope. This was the last one that he had, and then he was replaced by Obama after that. It's the only time in my life that I've ever been to the Vatican. And it happened on that day. We saw that procession. There were helicopters in the air, a huge military presence. And there came the black vehicles. And inside was the president of America. There in front of St. Peter's Cathedral. Incredible moment that I'll never forget. Yes, things are changing in the land of freedom. Pat Robertson, in the book, The New World Order, this is a very powerful religious leader, and he also ran for president at one point. He says on page 236, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, talking about Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state as an outright insult to God and His plan. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. So what he's saying here is that America shelved those laws about Sunday keeping because it violates the freedom of religion. But he says that's actually a big mistake because we must keep Sunday. He, he said keep the Sabbath day, but he's talking about Sunday, talking about the first day of the week actually. And this is what religious leaders are going to do. They're going to say, no, we've missed it because the country is, is talking about uh, freedom of religion and civil rights but look what's happening we we are going down 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 into the 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 mess and into the drain and we've actually lost sunday worship through this so we must break down this wall that separates church and state and we must enforce sunday worship people must come back to god then it's going to go better with our nation. You hear how good it sounds. But you know, friends, God never ever forces anyone to worship Him. He always calls us, come unto me. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He never ever forces anyone to follow Him. Yes, friends, in the last days, there's going to be a drive to bring the world together on one common denominator in Christianity, and that is Sunday worship. People will be forced to keep the first day of the week holy, to work on the other six. And each one of us is going to have to take a stand because the prophecy says that that beast that comes out of the earth will kill those who refuse to worship the beast that comes out of the sea. Where are we going to be in that day? Where will we be standing? On whose side will we be on? Where are we going to cast our vote? The Word of God is calling us back to the truths of Scripture. 
back to that which was lost during the dark ages, back to a saving relationship, a relationship of freedom with Jesus Christ. And how do we really find revival? Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And that happens individually. You cannot force people with legislation and laws passed by governments to bring about a revival. It's every person going down on their knees, falling on their faces before the Lord and worshipping Him and not being forced by government power to do this. Yes, friends, the only way is to ask personally for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will empower you like it did in the times of the apostles to stand boldly for Jesus, to preach the word undiluted whatever the results may be. Yes, Jesus is calling people to follow Him, to love Him, and to show their love by keeping His Ten Commandments, the law of love. Yes, friends, we mustn't look. These other revivals, many of them have some truth. They do have some truth. Satan always uses some truth in his counterfeits. They do have some love. And they do have power. But that is not the test to know if it's true or not. We must see according to the law and the testimony. If they don't speak according to this, there is no light in them. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to follow Him all the way. This is an amazing story. It happened in the first century. Paul was imprisoned in Rome. But though he was in chains, his influence was spreading throughout the city. And 40 Roman soldiers became Christians. And when this happened, the leaders in the Roman army decided they are going to make an example of these soldiers that have gone now and started worshipping this so-called Christ. These 40 soldiers refused to burn incense to the Caesar. And so they were taken to the north of Italy. There was ice and snow. And they were stripped. They were only left the bare little covering garments. And they were forced, these 40 soldiers, to stand the whole night on the ice. And the legions, these leaders of the Roman army, they made a nice big bonfire for themselves. They were cooking and laughing and joking and drinking while these faithful followers of Jesus were standing shivering, freezing, exposed to the elements. Sometimes some of that warm air from the fire would go over their bodies and it would bring a moment of relief. But the ice cold just crept into their bones and their feet and their fingers started getting frostbite and they were starting to lose movement and this cold was overwhelming them. At one point, one of these, there's one thing I didn't tell you, these 40 soldiers 
were singing while this was all happening. They said, 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. To thee be the glory, the honor, and the praise forever. 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. And then suddenly one guy couldn't handle it anymore. And he ran away from them. And he said, I will burn incense to the Caesar. And then they sang, 39 wrestlers for thee, O Christ. To thee be the praise, the honor, and the glory. And then suddenly a very strange thing happened. One of these Roman leaders took off his garment. And he walked away, crossing to the 39, and he looked back, he said, I will become a Christian. And then they started to sing again, 40 wrestlers for thee, O Christ, to thee be the honor, the praise, and the glory forever. Friends, Jesus is calling us to take a stand for him. Revelation 14 verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Any revival that leads you away from this is a false revival. We need to allow God to write His law on the table of our hearts. Friend, Jesus is calling you to take a stand for him tonight. Will you stand with those soldiers who risked losing their lives for Jesus? Will you stand with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Will you stand with Joseph, Moses, and Daniel? Will you stand with Peter, James, and John? Are you willing to stand? for Christ tonight.